This is the Sea Harrier, a Cold War jet fighter most famous for its exploits in the Falklands conflict of 1982. The British force sent to recapture the islands initially had just 20 of these aircraft, up against over a hundred Argentine fighters. And yet, despite the odds, it was the Harriers that came out on top. However, this isn't just any Sea Harrier. This is ZA-175, a new arrival at IWM Duxford. She is the only jet in the Imperial War Museum collection to have shot down an enemy in air-to-air -air combat, a feat she accomplished at the hands of renowned Sea Harrier pilot Nigel Sharkey Ward. Today, we'll tell the story of the Sea Harrier, the Falklands conflict, and the man who flew this aircraft into battle. In the late 1960s, Britain's armed forces were running short of money. The Royal Navy needed new aircraft carriers, but they had to cancel their planned CVA-01 because they didn't have the funds. Unable to build conventional fleet carriers capable of operating large supersonic jets, instead the Navy was forced to build smaller, invincible-class light carriers designed primarily for anti-submarine warfare. The only problem was finding an aircraft which could operate from their comparatively tiny decks. Enter the Harrier. The Harrier was a special aircraft as it had a V-style capability or vertical short takeoff and landing. That meant it could take off and land from a very short runway or even vertically. It did this with four nozzles which redirected the flow from its Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine. As a result, the Harrier could operate much more flexibly than conventional aircraft. It was the obvious choice for the Royal Navy. The Harrier's origins trace back to the Hawker Siddeley P-1127 from the early 1960s, an experimental aircraft which proved that V-Stall was possible. From these foundations, the Harrier GR-1 entered RAF service in 1969 as the world's first operational V-Stall fighter. Its key selling point was its flexibility, able to operate from dispersed sites without the need for long runways. It was followed into service by the improved GR-3 in the mid-1970s, and it was this aircraft which would provide the basis for the Sea Harrier. The Sea Harrier was designed to operate at sea, not just as a fighter, but as a strike and reconnaissance aircraft too. That meant some changes had to be made which we can see by comparing the Sea Harrier to our GR3 here at IWM Duxford. The most obvious change was the aircraft's longer front fuselage. This was to accommodate the new Blue Fox radar system developed for the Sea Harrier. The aircraft was also fitted with a raised cockpit to facilitate better visibility for the pilot. In a dogfight, visibility can be the difference between life and death. Finally, smaller adjustments were also made to suit operation at sea. And obviously the paint scheme is a bit different, but we'll come back to that later on. This is where Nigel Sharkey Ward enters our story. Sharkey, a nickname given to every ward in the Royal Navy, joined up as a cadet in 1962. Having served with 892 Naval Air Squadron flying Phantoms on HMS Ark Royal, Sharkey was then appointed to lead the Sea Harrier development program in 1976. Sharkey brought the aircraft into service within budget and on schedule in 1980, quite a feat for jet aircraft at the time. He was then given command of the Intensive Flying Trials Unit at Yeovilton, with instructions to prepare the Sea Harrier and its pilots for war. I was very keen to demonstrate to a lot of doubters around the bazaars, in the service as well as in other services, the true worth of this uh, wonderful little aeroplane. And of course, the biggest thing was to prove yourself. It's all very well being well respected in peacetime exercises, even on very closely instrumented ranges. But none of us knew how we were going to perform for real once we came under fire. It wouldn't be long before Sharkey and his men got a chance to test their skills. On the 2nd of April 1982, Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands, a remote British territory in the South Atlantic. Three days later, a British task force set sail to take the islands back. 
Among them was 801 Naval Air Squadron aboard HMS Invincible, to which Sharkey had been appointed commander, and 800 Naval Air Squadron aboard HMS Hermes. Initially, the British had just 20 Sea Harriers en route to the Falklands, including ZA-175. There, they would face an Argentine force of Skyhawks, Daggers, Mirages and Super Eton Darts, numbering over a hundred aircraft. Given the odds, some British officials concluded that losses among Sea Harrier pilots would be heavy. RAF GR3s were soon en route as reinforcements. Meanwhile, Sharkey was focused on preparing his squadron for battle. With the Sea Harrier having recently entered service, not all the weapon delivery trials had been completed, and so trials were carried out over the next few days. Sharkey also knew that night flying experience would be essential, so he ensured that 801 Squadron pilots were fully night qualified by the time they arrived in the South Atlantic. One important change was to the then white undersides of the Sea Harriers. These proved easy to spot, and so all the aircraft were repainted in the low visibility, extra dark sea grey scheme of the time. The British fighters were far outnumbered by their Argentine opponents, but having trained extensively over the past two years, Sharkey was supremely confident in the abilities of the Sea Harrier and its pilots. We knew we could beat everybody at combat. There wasn't a question, maybe we can. We knew, I mean, the uh, squadron track record against the Phantom, for example, which is an old, a bit old-fashioned, uh, was 25 to 1 superiority by ourselves against the F-14, which has got these swept wings, you know, a very slow roll rate, very manoeuvrable except for slow roll rate, about 40 to 1. The top aircraft, the F-15, only 3 to 1, but the F-15 is a super aeroplane, but we had a 3 to 1 ascendancy over them. I and mean, that's taking the squadron as a whole, the top guys in the squadron. There are a couple of us who well, were actually quite good. My personal kill rate against the F-15 was 25 to 1 in the Sea Harrier. Sharkey was right to feel confident. When the British task force reached the Falkland Islands, the Sea Harriers saw active combat for the first time. In the initial air-to-air -air battles on the 1st of May, Three Argentine aircraft were shot down, and a fourth substantially damaged and later shot down by friendly fire when it tried to land. No Sea Harriers were lost. It was a vindication of Sharkey's work over the preceding years. That didn't mean that things were easy, however. In order to maintain three combat air patrols of two aircraft each around the Falkland Islands, 18 Sea Harriers had to be airborne at once, six on station, six en route, and six returning. As a result, the Sea Harrier pilots and crews were stretched to their limits, and gaps inevitably appeared. When the British landed at San Carlos on the 21st of May, surface ships were left exposed, and over the following four days, three British ships were sunk and eight damaged by the Argentines. We expected a harder fight than we got from them, but at the same time, we found them a, a very brave lot. We were sitting there saying, well, surely they can't come in again today. They've lost so many already. And this is talking about San Carlos and whatever. And in they'd come, much to our great ad admiration and respect for them. You know, it wasn't easy for them. Uh, must have been very terrifying, actually. But they did it. Uh, so I've got the highest respect. The Argentines suffered all sorts of problems in the Falklands. A lack of training and poor serviceability of their aircraft was compounded by the sheer distances they had to fly to get to the combat zone and the failure of many Argentine bombs to actually explode. Meanwhile, the British had the latest technology at their disposal, which made the Sea Harrier even more deadly. The Sea Harriers had departed from Portsmouth with a limited number of Sidewinder heat-seeking missiles. They had few AIM-9Gs and even fewer of the latest AIM-9Ls. An urgent request to the US government resulted in supplies of the AIM-9L intended for US forces in Europe being diverted to the South Atlantic. This decision was to prove key to the Sea Harriers' success during the conflict. The AIM-9L could attack from all directions, including head-on, which made it ideal for the combat missions of the Falklands conflict. Of the 20 aircraft shot down by Sea Harrier pilots during the conflict, 16 were shot down using the AIM-9L. 
That brings us back to ZA-175. The aircraft was flown by several different pilots from 801 Naval Air Squadron on board HMS Invincible, but its most notable exploits were at the hands of Sharky Ward. On the 21st of May, Sharky achieved this aircraft's only aerial victory. At 1721, he launched on his third combat air patrol of the day with his number two Lieutenant Steve Thomas. West of San Carlos, Ward saw two daggers below about a mile away and led the attack. Thomas downed both aircraft with sidewinders. However, unbeknownst to them, there was a third dagger on Sharky's tail. And this was really driving my mind crazy at the time. It was a wonderful thing to see. You know, this is it's happening. It's terrific. But while I was thinking like that, rather than being clever, there was a third dagger who was behind me, who was firing his cannons at me. Although I didn't know it at the time, so I didn't care about it. And as I saw this second Mirage being knocked down, or nearly knocked down, we thought, I then thought, Christ, you know, watch a six o'clock truck. And I was still in the hard turn the whole time. And I looked round, and there was this Mirage passing underneath me. Beautiful colours in camouflage. Starting from behind, going towards the head, and all I had to do really was pull down hard. And because uh, I was only at about 300 feet anyway, I mean, pulled down hard, he was right on the deck. And uh, he didn't stand a chance because I got in behind him and fired my missile. Luckily, all three Argentine pilots bailed out and survived the battle. For Sharkey, the engagement, which lasted barely 60 seconds, was the pinnacle of his career, the action he'd been waiting his whole life to experience. Though the odds seemed impossible, the Sea Harrier and its pilots silenced the doubters, and by the end of the conflict on the 14th of June, the British dominated the skies over the Falklands. It had taken 74 days, but the islands were finally back in British hands. The 28 Sea Harriers deployed to the South Atlantic had flown over 1,100 combat air patrol sorties, shooting down 20 Argentine aircraft. Six were lost during the war four to accidents, two to ground fire, and none in air-to-air -air combat. As for ZA-175, she was later upgraded to FA-2 status in 1994, before being deployed to Bosnia in 97, Iraq in 98, and Kosovo in 99. She retired from service at Yeovilton in 2003, and after several years on loan to the Norfolk and Suffolk Aviation Museum, she's finally settled at her forever home at IWM Duxford. Sharky Ward was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for Gantry for his actions during the Falklands conflict and the Air Force Cross for services to v Aviation. Sharky retired from the Royal Navy in 1985, but followed into the fleet air arm by one of his sons. A truly remarkable man, Sharky sadly passed away in 2024.